Akira Koko, Namihi, Namihi Kia Koko, Titi Hui Mine. Uh, welcome to this uh, workshop of the government, some department, I guess, around the uh, representation review. Um, I think we've got all our technologies up and running, which is all good. Sorry for being um, five or ten minutes late. We've just, uh, just been getting a few councillors' computers sorted out, so that's all good. Um, so the, the purpose of our meeting today, this is the first workshop in the in the representation review as um, we're going through the process of reviewing the, um, the representation for the elections for the Otago Regional Council. And we've got uh, Amanda's sort of running it, but probably more so we have Stephen Hall here, who's, who's um, representative from elections.com. And I think um, Stephen and a man will be working pretty close together to provide us uh, um, the motion for the workshop here today. So I'll pretty much pass it up to your head table. Welcome along, Stephen, and thank, thank you, you for, uh, for coming down and talking with us. No and we're all um, looking forward to having um, some good discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Lloyd. I'll also introduce Lisa um, from Comms and Marketing, who has done a huge amount of work already around the um, early engagement. Sure. Uh, piece that's been done and we'll be helping once the final proposal is, oh, sorry, not final, once the initial proposal is notified, getting that out um, to to the community. Yeah. All right, I was just introducing for the benefit of the recording, just introducing Lisa from Comms and Marketing, who's also done a huge amount of work. And actually just for councillors' background, our GRS team here at the ORC has also done an enormous amount of work supporting us with this to date in terms of mapping out the various options and getting all the data from Stats New Zealand to then translate it into what options might be possible. So it's a real team effort. Great, thank you. Kia ora koutou. great to be here again. Um, so this is actually the second workshop that we've done. You might, you might have forgotten the first one. Uh, it was a little while ago and that was really just an introduction to the rep review process, what it's all about, what we'll be looking at. Um, so I'm going to just spend a very short time uh, this morning doing a bit of recap and just going over some of the key principles um, of what we are working to through this process. But this session is really all about um, getting into the, the work of the re review and in particular um, an, an opportunity for you as elected members to do some thinking and to give some steer to uh, staff as to the direction that you want us to take in preparing the options for, for the rep review. So um, just covering off the, a bit of the recap, as we've um, looked at before, the rep review is a statutory requirement. Um, every council has to go through this process at least every six years. They can do it more frequently if there are opportunities or reasons that might, might trigger that. Uh, for Otago, your last review was in the 2018-19 period, uh, prior to the 2019 elections. So we are due for um, another review, and any new arrangements that we put in place through this review will apply for the 2025 and 2028 elections, unless we were to have um, another rep review prior to the 2028 elections, which is um, always an option. There are three key um, matters to be determined in the review. Um, very simply, they are the number of constituencies, how many constituencies will, will we have, uh, what are the boundaries and what are the names of those constituencies, and what is the number of elected members. So that's both the total number of elected members and the distribution of elected members across those constituencies. Um, it's primarily a two-step process. Uh, there is a lot of preliminary work, and as Amanda's referred to, a lot of work already been done in terms of uh, GIS uh, analysis and mapping and uh, preliminary engagement. Uh, so that's going to be ongoing through this process as well. But essentially, we are looking at um, the first key step being the adoption of an initial proposal, uh, which can only be one proposal, it's, it, it cannot be options. Uh, so we are working towards uh, deciding what that proposal will be. Um, we'll talk about the timeline in a minute. And that initial proposal goes out for public consultation, so it's a statutory consultation requirement. Um, after that process is completed, then we come to the final proposal, which um, gives the council the opportunity to make changes to its initial proposal or to affirm that that is the proposal that it wants to, to put forward. So just looking at the timeline, um, it's uh, 
there are some key statutory steps and dates that we have to meet, and the first of those is highlighted on the on the screen. Um, 31st of July is the very last date by which the initial proposal can be um, adopted and then publicly notified for consultation. Um, a series of steps then that follow on from that, um, which take us through to the final proposal and the last statutory date for that final proposal is the 3rd of November. So uh, we've, we've got a, um, some time uh, to work through those dates and we'll, we'll talk about some of the steps that we're, we're working towards. So again, just recapping what's already um, transpired through this process. There were a couple of key steps that were kind of outside but related to the rep review process. And the first was the voting system, uh, single transferable vote um, or first past the post. Um, so the STV vote is in place. There was no demand for a poll received. Um, so again, that will apply for the 2025 and 2028 elections. On the question of Māori representation, councils had the opportunity up to late November last year to, um, uh, to consider putting in place Māori representation. Uh, this council engaged with, um, uh, with iwi through the mana to mana process um, and no decision was taken to establish a Māori constituency um, at, at this stage. So the next opportunity to do that would be prior to the um, 2028 electoral cycle. So today is all about um, thinking and uh, giving a steer to, um, to staff, as I mentioned earlier. It's a workshop. It's not a decision-making meeting. Uh, we want to bring you information to um, help your uh, consideration of the, of the review, and we want to give you the opportunity to give guidance to staff about how you see the, um, the options and the issues that we're, that we're grappling with. So we're seeking your guidance and we're seeking an initial indication of your views around the options that we'll be presenting and any issues that we need to explore uh, further and do any more um, analysis on. And, and that could be around the communities of interest questions. It could be around ward boundaries. Uh, there's a range of things that we'll, that we'll look at. But it's essentially around what's the number and the makeup of those constituencies and the number of elected members. So we want today's discussion to be um, constructive in terms of helping staff to go away and do any further work that's required in developing the options. Um, and then that will inform your decision making around the initial proposal in a couple of months time. And as we go through uh, this session this morning, there are some key questions that we've highlighted in the uh, presentation. We'll, we'll probably pause and, and allow some time for discussion of those questions. Uh, because they will be really helpful for us to do some thinking around. Yeah. Uh, recapping the current arrangements, you're very familiar with these. We don't uh, need to really revisit this. 12 councillors um, elected across four constituencies, and that's a model that's been in place for some time. And through the last two representation reviews in 2012 and 2018, that's um, uh, remained pretty much intact. And you can see, see the, uh, the map of the constituencies as they are currently constituted um, on the screen uh, in front of you now. So that's one that we're familiar with. So first question to think about as we look to develop options for this review is what's changed since 2018. And clearly the, one of the first and most significant issues is uh, population growth. So comparing the numbers from the 2018 representation review with um, the data from the June 2023 population estimates from StatsNZ, we're looking at an overall growth in population across Otago of over 30,000. Uh, it's almost a 12% increase. Um, and that's not evenly spread across all of the constituencies, as you can see from the, the right-hand column. Um, much higher level of growth in the Dunstan Ward uh, than in the other three constituencies. So that's been a significant um, factor and it, uh, that's helped staff do some initial thinking around how, how might we address that in the options that we bring to you. Um, it's worth thinking about any other relevant changes that I think have, uh, that we think have occurred over the past um, five to six years. A lot of development um, has occurred, particularly in those Queenstown, Wanaka, and Cromwell areas with uh, significant res residential development. We've had the establishment of 
the FMUs, the freshwater management units uh, in 2019, and um, those, are, those are now working um, across the region as well. I'd be interested to get any reflections from you about what you're seeing in terms of demographic changes. You know, what are we seeing in terms of um, the makeup of our community? And we've got transport linkages that have been growing and developing and changing over, over time as well. Um, there's material coming through in the long-term plan and around the public transport, uh, public transport network in Dunedin and Queenstown, cycleway connections, those kinds of issues as well, which impact on the nature of the communities that we serve and the connections between them. So happy to just open for a couple of minutes of informal discussion of what are the what are any other relevant and pertinent changes that um, that councillors are seeing across the region. Andrew, you can yeah, thanks, Stephen. Just reflecting on the, the the representation model unchanged from previous reviews, well, if you have any, that in mind, do we know the population uh, data back to well, you will it'll be there somewhere uh, two thousand and twelve because. The relevance of the percentage change probably look a bit different if you take it back to 2012 when we settled on this current mm -hmm. regime. You understand my question? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, we haven't got that in information in front of us at the moment, but it certainly is available and and can help to inform the, the work that we do around. Yeah, Alexa. Related to that is the uh, growth in, D in Dunstan is uneven. So you've got a lot of urban growth in Queenstown, Wainaka and Cromwell and not so much further down the catchment. So I expect that will be taken into account, will it? Will you look back at that more granular level? Yes. Uh, yes, we do. Um, but we have to look at uh, wider population numbers in terms of actually formulating the proposals. But yes, um, certainly it's clear that there is some um, concentration in urban areas that... Uh, of the, of the constituency. Great, thanks. Uh, Brian? Uh, in a similar vein, <clears throat> the population increase in Dunedin is actually understates it. Um, you've got Dunedin Ward going up from 110 to say 114,000. And you've got the Molyneux Ward going up from 35 to 38, mm -hmm. going up 7%. And if I was a betting person, the increase in the Molyneux Ward will be the increase in Moscow, which mm -hmm. is actually part of Dunedin. Mm -hmm. um, just make that point. And it's been raised in some of the community feedback as well. Yeah, yeah. something we're conscious yeah. of. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Uh, any other questions? Great, Brian, I think Stephen. Great. So, um, as Amanda mentioned, uh, we have gone out to do some initial um, informal feedback from the community um, that has included uh, writing to the um, constituent territorial authorities, just asking for their views on the, on the current situation. Um, also writing to the Runanga chairs uh, and some discussion at the Mana to Mana sessions, again, seeking their views on the current um, makeup and represent of representation and any views about you know, what that might look like in the future. Uh, we've also undertaken a short survey, uh, which went out in February. Um, not an overwhelming response, uh, but interesting to see the, 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 the views that are coming through. And you can see a breakdown on, on this slide of uh, where those responses have come from, uh, quite strongly uh, weighted towards the Dunstan area and, and more so um, in, from urban areas than from, than from rural areas. And some of the feedback from those um, uh, questions in the survey are uh, uh, referenced in the next few slides as we as we go through. So as I mentioned, the key points that we need to be looking at um, in this session and to, to inform the initial proposal is what's the number of our constituencies, what are their, what should be their boundaries, what should be their names, and uh, the number of elected members total number. Um, and how those members are distributed across the constituencies. So they, they need to be formally identified and determined in the initial proposal. They are put out as a proposal uh, to the community for consultation. And so um, we work through this, we want to get your initial views on some of those points. And we have some initial options that we will probably focus a lot of our discussion on this morning uh, for you to have a think about what they might look like. 
Can I just ask a question? Can we just pop back to that demographics, uh, the uh, the people that responded slide? And I'm just wondering, it might be a bit random. Does that represent like 63% urban and 37% rural? Does that basically represent the split of our region as well? Do you know? It's no, a bit no, random, no, I know. No, 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 no. Urban would be a lot higher. Yeah. Well, I'm just, yeah, oh, yeah, it yeah. would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. so it wasn't designed to be a I know, statistically I know it wasn't. I'm just, sample. Yeah, just but, kind of well, thinking. It's always interesting to see who does yeah. respond, yeah. Yeah, and it was also self-identified. So it was the person nominating whether they identified as urban or rural, so it's not Thanks. that they applaud it as well. Thank you. Uh, I think also interesting on that slide is there's 24 responses from Dunstan against only 19 from Dunedin. Showed more interest there, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Size of population is probably similar. Always so. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to distract. Uh, not quite. No. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, we talked last time about the, the three uh, key principles that underpin the, the representation of you that the decisions need to be based on. Um, and just to recap on those is, um, I think, probably useful. And the first one of those is communities of interest. So um, the way the representation arrangements are put in place should represent the communities of interest across the district. I think, as I mentioned last time, this is one of those helpful things that's set out in legislation but not defined. Um, but the Local Government Commission does give us some, some guidance around uh, what constitutes community of, of interest, and those around perceptual factors, like how people identify and think about the places they live, how they function within those uh, areas, and the political dimensions of how people are represented. So the communities of interest help us to think about how many constituencies and what are the boundaries of those constituencies. So do they make sense from a community of interest point of view, do they? Um, will people living in those constituencies feel that this is a um, an area that that represents the place that they have an interest? The second uh, key principle is effective representation, which is really about the number of elected members that are um, allocated to each constituency. Um, is is that sufficient to? Uh, to effectively represent the interests and the needs of, of those communities. There's an interplay between all of these factors. So you, you, you move one lever and it adjusts things on, on another um, part, of the, part of the equation, but um, we, we take all of, all of these into account. And the third one is the fair representation, which is the plus or minus 10% requirement, which looks across the, um, the, the total uh, population um, the number of uh, elected members per, per population, and there's a requirement that across the region um, that the population per member ratio is within 10% plus or minus of that average across the district. So that's about giving approximately equal value to, to all votes. So that helps us to ensure that there's um, some equality of representation across the region. Um, as I said, uh, communities of interest, um, no fixed definitions, uh, but we think about how people identify with an area, we think about how they, uh, how they relate to uh, services, facilities, recreation, transport in, the, in an area, um, how they live day to day uh, within a particular place. And, and then does it make sense in terms of political representation? Now that's particularly uh, particularly important for a regional council because there is a specific requirement under section 19 UC of the Local Government Act, um, which requires regional councils, um, as far as is practicable, to align their constituency boundaries with the uh, the boundaries or ward boundaries of territorial authorities and their wards. So the 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 intention is that we um, aim to align with um, district or ward boundaries of the territorial authorities. But we also have to take into account those um, factors of that community identity and belonging. Um, I think also relevant for a regional council is the, the, the physical and topographical features, and I think we can include uh, environmental features in there. We, we reference things like the catchment areas, the FMUs, um, as well as being part of the way we might think about and define a community of interest. 
and the similarities between the um, similarities and differences between people living in, in an area. We can take into account the history and the rohe or takiwa of the iwi and hapu in an area as well. And also looking at the way that facilities and services are accessed um, and used and available to people within, within each area. So just um, a little bit more on, particularly on that section relating to regional council uh, boundaries. Yes, they should reflect communities of interest, um, but the Act requires us so far as is practical, practicable to coincide with TA boundaries or with ward boundaries. And so in practice, most regional councils, and, and it is the case, do align to TA boundaries. Now, they may be a district boundary or they may be a ward boundary, but it's, it's aligned to one of those boundaries. But there are some exceptions, and they can be based on other, uh, some of those other factors that help us think about what a communities, uh, what a communities of interest uh, may be. Um, in particular, environmental um, factors such as catchment areas might be a factor that can also be taken into account in defining a community of interest. And so, as I mentioned, we've taken um, some consideration of the FMU and catchment boundaries in the options that we're looking at this morning. So I guess one of the first questions for us to think about is do the current constituencies, as we saw on the map just a couple of slides back, reflect the communities of interest across the region as it is at the moment? We'll, we'll have a bit of a discussion on that, but perhaps first of all, if we just look at some of the early feedback from, um, from the survey, again, not a high level of response, but interesting to see just what, what uh, comment has come back. So we ask the question, do you feel that the current constituencies are working well? That's those constituencies based on a geographically defined area and, and population. Um, and the, the feedback was... Uh, uh, more strongly weighted towards the no than uh, the yes, um, with 54% saying no, they did not, 16% unsure, oh sorry, 25% unsure, and 21% saying yes, they agree that the constituencies currently worked well. But what's interesting is to drill down into that feedback, and you find that, um, my reading anyway, is that the, the feedback is predominantly around the level of representation in those constituencies. So we have comments like, our population in the Pakatipu Wanaka areas has grown rapidly in recent years, and we have a lot of very challenging issues to contend with. We need more regional councillors to focus on these issues or a separate constituency. So that, that was one that came through from a number of respondents. Um, then there's the urban rural issue that came through in, in some responses as well. So comments like, so many of the issues and concerns are rurally based and yet the urban population uh, and representation dominates. And then there's the question around uh, Wingatui and Mosgiel being part of Dunedin. Uh, and that came through in, in a couple of responses as well. So um, we asked the, the questions, would an increase in elected members for the Dunstan constituency enable you to have better access to your elected representatives? And uh, quite strongly, yes, 67%. Uh, we asked, would the creation of an Upper Lakes ward or constituency enable you to have better access to your ele elected representatives? And again, quite, quite strongly, um, yes, uh, answered to that question. So we'll just slip back a couple of slides um, to that communities of, of interest question and thinking about that community feedback plus um, some of the, the comments that we've already had on the table today. Um, how well do you think the current constituencies do or don't reflect the communities of interest across the region today. Happy to have some discussion on, on that. Alexa. I don't think they they do up my way, which is the Queen's at the Upper Lakes area. Uh, and I don't want to talk for what I'm here. I'll let you do that. But um I think there really is an issue for the urban areas of the Upper Lakes in representation. They um, really, and I can't. I find it really hard to get around the whole area. And uh, the other two councillors tend to be more rurally focused, mm -hmm. which is fine. That's um, that's where they sit. Although uh, one of those councillors does live in Cromwell, but. Um, 
for Queenstown and Wanaka, I do feel really stretched and I think people feel that I'm stretched and that there's a community of interest between Wanaka, Queenstown and Cromwell based in tourism and um, maybe some horticulture even, winemaking particularly, that, that are separate from other parts of the region and um, the urban issues that they face and the growth that they face is at a very different level from anywhere further east. And Cromwell needs to be included in that because they also face that growth as a result of Queenstown and Wanaka's growth. And of course, there's small communities in between there too. There's communities like Luggett, um, Kingston, Makawura, all facing um, very similar issues. Thanks. Thanks, Alexis. Any other comments? I think it's probably, well, oh, just from the video, sorry, Bob. I think it's probably, a, 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 sorry, um, I think we could probably have a, don't even need a discussion, I'm not, I'm not uh, unhappy, but the Molyneux Ward also has probably two distinct different communities of interest here. Mm -hmm. The South Otago, rural, pretty rural based community, then you've got the You've got the Mosgill zone, which is um, is probably more Dunedin than rural based, although they probably have leaned a little bit towards the rural. Yeah, and it's part part of the the it's just a part of it's just going up towards Little March as well. So there's sort of a bit of a mix of rural and urban, etc., etc., which is sort of like a just like the Dunedin city boundaries have formed as well. But yeah. I think what I think the way it is now works fine, but it's just a, you know. Mm -hmm. Um with Brian first of all, then Claire. Yeah, um my view is that this particular topic can Sorry. be my view is that um this particular topic can't be viewed in isolation. So you know we're we're just looking at this and we'll come to the conclusion and we'll move on to the next one. Um, so at the previous reviews, I think that the decisions uh, uh, that were made were fair and reasonable. Um, but, you know, looking to the future, um, there just might need to be a reconsideration of communities of interest, depending on how the numbers sort of fall. Um, because historically, um, it, you know, the various urban areas were put into various areas um, to make them viable. You know, for example, you know, for example, the reason Moskills and the Molyneux Ward is to make the ward viable. And, and the reality is, is that, um, is that over time, um, all the councillors have been rural based. Correct me if I'm wrong, you know, but and the big picture thing, and that was sort of fine because the council was at six in Dunedin and they had six in the more rural setting. And then you've got Alexa's point, you know, that actually it's not Dunedin and then rural. You've actually got this huge urban space up in central mm -hmm. Otago. So anyway, my point is, is Communities of interest cannot be viewed in isolation. It actually needs to look at the numbers, needs to be to come up with something, I believe, that is fair and equitable for the whole council and for the council to be functional, so that the council can actually do its job. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Hello, uh, Elliot. Um, yeah, I... I, I... I think that that's tricky to, to you know create any lines that perfectly carve up a region, um, and that I wouldn't want to compromise the you know fairness that 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 ratio of representation um, just to have a certain um, constituency or or, or something. Um, Reflected, I think that the 
district and city council boundaries are certainly an imperfect measure, but are arguably much clearer communities of interest than our current um, like wards or constituencies. Um, I've also I've been playing around on um, Google Sheets and managed to carve those district and city ones in a way that, that kept within the 10% um, of, of fairness. But, but people aren't going to like, like it, but I'm <laughs> um, happy to share that a bit, a bit later if that's of interest. Um, the only issues I see with that are, as Alexa mentioned, Cromwell being quite intimately connected with um, Queenstown Lakes um, and more rural parts of the Dunedin like city boundary like um, uh, Middle March and stuff would you know end up being included in Dunedin City but I think there's always imper imperfections there and stuff and, and these calculations actually surprised me at how perfect they ended up being but yeah. Right. Thank you Elliot. I think there's a few scenarios in front of us so yeah. yep we'll listen to them all. Any Anybody else? Got any comments around where we're at currently? Ryan? Sorry, apologies, but yeah, one final point. You know, so for example, up in Alexa's patch, you know, historically we've had situations where, you know, the the number of councillors that have come out of the Mani Taito would be disproportionately, you know, we've had situations where um, the whole Central Otago ward um, was basically had. I think they had three many a Toto councillors because there were issues of contention. It was, you know, you know, you can set up all these communities of interest and all this type of stuff, but but actually people that will stand will reflect maybe the issues of the day, and it won't necessarily actually be uh, uh, representatives of the communities of interest. And and you know, and what I take from Alexa's feedback is that actually, while all that's going on, you've got this whole important urban area, Queenstown, Wanaka, that we're not doing justice to the issues that are there. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Andrew? I just had a quick look back to pre-2012, and obviously there used to be 11 councils around the table, and um, they were having obviously a similar discussion before we had yeah. now, and there was an additional councillor added to the Dumpston Ward. And it sort of seems to me we're nearly sort of at that point again. Um, I think it's probably difficult um, to slice up uh, the region any differently than it currently is to get better representation because a lot of it does depend on where elected members reside and if you take Alexa for example um, living in Queenstown at the top end and um, Michael and, and Gary in the sort of not the lower end but in the I suppose in the heart of um, Dunstan in a geographical sense so um, a lot, lot of that and you take Lloyd and um, and Kate, for example, either end of, of the Molyneux Ward, and that wasn't the case last, last term, mm. for example. But So you get that um, ability uh, to probably get a, a more pure spread of representation depending on where the councillors live, yeah. and you've got no control over that. So um, I'm not sure whether the comments are helpful, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, um, you're, you're right. It is, it is a reality that we can design, um, you know, a structure that we, we think meets communities of interest, but that doesn't guarantee where candidates will, will stand from. And so um, that's a, um, another challenge. Well, <coughs> um, probably a candidate has to be in the area that they're representing, though, don't they? Yeah. Yes. So, no, 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 no. But they so, have, so, you have to declare if you're not. Yeah. You have to say in your statement, I'm hope. So, so I have to be nominated by somebody. Yeah, I would love to leave them to stay for more of you. Yep, 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 absolutely. You'd have to be nominated by people that live there. Residents in multiple of you. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. That's happened with, that's happened, I think, more of you anyway, yeah. I think it probably, you know, there's all sorts of connotations, isn't there? It's like you have, um, like, to get the perfect representation, you just 
flipping through the draft and you go, and every time you get to 21 bills and you put in another councillor, and that's your area. Yeah, it's a fun <laughs> analogy. <laughs> well done, yeah. um, you know, so, you know, that, and that's going to give you your best geographic spread of all, but, you know, but then, you know, that uh, reduces the, well, reduces the, um, what we're going to say, the competitiveness of the seat or the, you know, the, you know, the other, but it's basically competitiveness because you've got one person is a bit different. You know, if you've got two, a ward with two or three people, you're going to create more activity there rather than just a one person seat. We will often you'll find one person will just sit there until someone until they retire because no one can stand against them, yeah. sort yeah. of thing. Well, we had four stand uh, and two two elections to go in a one seat. So your analogy is actually wrong, really. Yeah, uh, it's probably vacant. That's you know. There's all sorts of options, probably what I'm saying. So there's no perfect way. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I'm thinking with the numbers of councillors, I think we are going, and, and also with the demographics of our areas and how they're changing, I think we're going to have to redraw boundaries. I don't think there's uh, much point in simply adding another councillor into the Dunstan Ward. I think we have to think about, and I, I'd like us to concentrate on those communities of interest and how how things, and, and we may need to consider by hearing what you're saying, on the other side of the table, in my Dunedin councillors, that we might have to think about that for Mosgiel as well. So um, I think it's important. I don't at this point see a reason to add more councillors. We've already got really good representation numbers wise at um, at one per um, 18,000. And that's looks kind of about right, frankly, looking at those numbers there. Um, so I think we have to take the uh, a different line and possibly a more difficult one by thinking about how we redraw our boundaries. And they may not be exactly along territorial lines, though they probably would be along ward lines. So my thoughts there. Thank you. Yeah, so this is um, the, the, the next question is around the number of um, councillors. So worth having a look at this at this stage, I think. Um, legislation allows for up to 14. Uh, we've put a, a table there just showing a comparison with um, other regional councils. Um, and so the majority are, are 10 or more. There are, there are a few with smaller um, numbers, but they uh, tend to be, um, in most cases, smaller, smaller councils. Um, so yeah, I think the question of the number of councillors is a is a significant one, and um, you'll see in the options that we'll we'll have a look at shortly. We have we have offered up some scenarios both with the existing number of twelve and with an additional councillor added, so an option at both at twelve and thirteen. We'll have a look at those when we um, when we get to the numbers. Um, again, just some feedback from um, uh, the community. Um, do you support an increase in the number of overall councillors based on population growth? Um, interestingly, 63% uh, said no, which kind of seems a little bit contradictory to the previous feedback where people said we, we want more uh, representation in, in certain areas. So, uh, but um, this is not an unusual finding from most um, councils. Uh, you, you generally find that the population are, are not overly keen on increasing the number of councillors. I think we've got three, four questions now. We've got Elliot, um, Kevin, Tom, Henry. I was just wondering if you had mapped any options with less councillors. Not at this stage, no, no. Yeah. Be Thank you. Uh, probably to that point you've just made of people not wanting more councillors, uh, it's clearly said that they want them in different areas. So I think they're completely... Uh, they're not necessarily related, that the, the, the key driver is having them in the right spot. Um, and if we go back to that page that you had, and you don't need to put it about, uh, if it's, people are talking about this 18 to 20,000 touch, well, look, at the end of the day, um, that is pretty minimal. Um, if you look at Henry, they're 43,000, Greater London's 39,000, uh, Waikato, uh, which is 36,000. So at the end of the day, I don't think that's uh, 20,000 necessary. And if you take, if you extrapolate our population growth from 
uh, if you use the same percentage as the growth average 2025, which is when we're going to have representation, um, the same the same number of councillors, it's still only going to be uh, 22,000. So uh, it, it's not a huge number. The, the, the biggest issue we have, the biggest issue we have is being, I think the second largest geographical area to look after is, is where the councillors are and the ability of those councillors to actually uh, get around their constituents. It's a lot easier for a Dunedin councillor to catch a bus, even though he's got to pay full fare now, um, to catch a bus and get to constituents around Dunedin than it is for a, a Molyneux ward councillor uh, to get up the back of the staff tire or out to the back blocks of uh, Mowat Creek or whatever. So, yeah, <laughs> look, look, at the end of the day, that's that's the thing to me that really needs to be looked at. Yeah, um, about the bus system. Eh? <laughs> yeah, better bus system is exactly the answer. <laughs> so we need a better bus system. Yeah, and uh, and half-wise fares. <laughs> so so that, that to me is that, and, and you know, I've, I've taken that, um, extrapolated out the, Population's growth and put them in the same areas, and we're still would still be at our uh, twelve councillors. We're still at 22,000 22, uh, in in putting Dunedin. Uh, yeah, look, yeah, if you put Dunedin down to five, you're still sitting at twenty three thousand, which is only five percent above the minimum. Uh, whereas uh, Mulraki will still be uh, be at twenty four thousand, still be way above uh, anyone else for a representation level anyway. So, I think we're yeah. I just think it's the number of people uh, and the size of the landscape that you have got to look after, because this is an environmental. Uh, this is an environmental council. We're looking after the environment, so we're looking after the land. Uh, we have to, and the pressures that it creates by urban, not no problem at all. But uh, I can look at um, twenty housing issues on one bus trip along George Street. And the residential part of it, as opposed to look at uh, the same number in in Mauraki, I might have to cover two hundred k's. Mm. So that's the part to me that's the the, the key is, um, yeah. The num I think we've got the number right. Mm. Uh, and if you look at the other councils, what who they have? Uh, Greater Wellington, five hundred thousand people. They've got thirteen uh, horizons, uh, which is a hugely rural based area. There's two hundred eighteen thousand, same as us, twelve. Uh, Waikato, which is highly rural, um, with a wee bit of a township, we built a bit of a few buildings in Hamilton, which is uh, 440,000 with 12 councillors. So I think it's uh, the scope of the area and where we position people is the most important part. Thanks, Kevin. We've got Tom Andrew Ryan. Um, I'll, I'll just, could you go back to that graph? That was, I mean, the pie graph that you were showing just before. Yeah, um, it seems that the survey is informing a lot of this presentation. Um, and I was just wondering if we could just once again um, put that into perspective. You had how many responses for this full survey? 64, 64. 64 responses, 64 people yeah. responded. Um, and the majority of those people were in the Dustin area, is that right? So is, is that a, a fair representation of views to inform this presentation? I think not. I'm happy just to comment on that and that the early engagement is provided to give another piece of information to the yeah. puzzle, but the options have been modelled on 12 or 13. The presentation is based on staff and, and, and expert advice, so the, right. the presentation hasn't been designed around the outcomes of the consultation. Okay. It's been designed, like it's an, it's an input, um, but also the workshop we have with councillors in December guided us around that upper lakes, um, you know, population growth. So there's been a number of inputs that have guided it. Right. But we certainly haven't taken this as gospel oh, and not look, just looks a bit that way. Okay, okay that's fine. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, yeah, that, that question, I suppose, um, guides people a certain way. Um, uh, do you support an increase in number of overall councillors based on population growth? Um, I think if I was asked that question, I would say no as well. But just thinking about the both slicing up the pie that we've currently got, and you know, Kevin mentioned about you know potentially the reduction uh, in Dunedin. 
because of the ability to serve a densely, densely populated urban area um, much more efficiently than an expansive area that, that he represents or Lloyd represents, for example, or even more so with um, the Dunstan Ward where Alexa is. So um, the scenarios that you're going to show us, I assume, will include that was a potential. You mentioned a couple of scenarios with, with one extra council, and obviously it potentially with the existing number sliced up in a different way. So maybe that's worth giving a bit more thought because there's no doubt about it. Um, Travelling on a bus or a car or a scooter or a push bike around an urban area um, to even you know lobby your you know during an election campaign versus travelling literally hundreds of kilometres um, in the other three constituencies it's a completely different kettle of fish in terms of time commitment absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Brian, can you come up? I would hate. Brian, come up I would hate to think. The number of councillors on this council is based on, you know, the cost um, to service, you know, the constituency. Um, yeah, that that's an input, and I accept that. But fundamentally, what the overarching key issue, one of the overarching key issues, you know, we've got some really contentious resource issues, and. And depending on uh, the background of a councillor and their constituency, um, you know, whether it's urban or whether it's rural, the reality is that can often impact on one's view and one's voting and all this type of stuff. So one needs to be careful about how we manipulate, you know, that breakdown of, of council representation on the basis of what it costs a bit more, takes a little bit more time. You know, maybe the, you know, you can do that in other ways to where if a council is actually traveling 200K, then they need to get a better financial allowance or, or something like this. But when it comes to one of the principal reasons that we're here is to represent the Otago region on key contentious resource issues, one needs to be careful how one changes things. Uh, I'll make that point. The second point I'll make is I actually think that that question you had up there um, was unfair. Because um, as Andrew says, if somebody asked me, you know, have, do you want to increase the number of councillors? Uh, uh, I'd probably say no as well. And, and one of the reasons I'd say no, or I think often people would say no is, oh shit, we have, in our rates, we have to pay for another councillor, which isn't actually the situation, is it? Because all that happens, that's another pie that needs to be split up. It's the financial income pie. Mm -hmm. So there's, you'll get an extra councillor at no extra cost. That wasn't put up there. So, you know, in terms of what's the optimal number, um, I've got my reservations about increasing the number. But nevertheless, I don't believe, I think that question could have had, could have spout that out, that there, there wasn't any cost implication. And you may find that that would influence your outcome. Thank Thank you. Brian, oh, look, just Brian, my comment was nothing to, to do about cost. It's simply the ability to get around and do the job. Yeah. Uh, so it's not, um, yeah, you know, we get, if we do certain mileage over a certain area, you, you get reimbursed that anyway, or you might get, but it's actually the, it's the time to do that function. Yeah. It's and, 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 so and, so and, it's, not, it's not the cost of it, Brian, that I'm, no, fair enough. And and but there might be another way of actually addressing that. So for example, we, you know, our constituencies maybe need to have a minimum of two councillors so that, you know, that particular issue can sort of be addressed and shared. Mm -hmm. Whereas like you're in a very difficult situation, you've got one council in one area, you know, the buck stops with you. Um, so you know, that that that's that's not good. But there, there might be different ways of addressing that was my main point as opposed to actually changing the fundamental uh, proportion, you know, distribution of councils on key resource issues around the table. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Elliot? Yeah, I, I, I agree with what Brian's saying there because, um, like, I totally understand what Councillor Melvin's saying about the difficulty of, of covering a big um, area and, and, and those distances. Um, but I think 
that's far more important that everyone across the region is is you know represented to the same degree in their in their votes. Um, and I think you know as councillors we all are here for the for the whole region, and we we all go to to things around the region. I do take that it's it's harder to get those bigger distances in those. Um, wider areas, but there's also, you know, a whole lot more people in Dunedin, so there's more, um, potentially more, you know, community events going on or, or, or whatever in that. And, and, and so I think, you know, maybe there are things we can do to better support um, those councils in those areas, but I, I don't think that unbalancing representation is, would be the answer there at all. Thanks. Have you ever think, do you want to say something, Amanda? I was just about to say that I think the next the next slide is the next kind of legislative guide that we've got to work within, and then we start to bring it all together, um, looking at options and boundaries, and starting to have these discussions. So it might be helpful um, yeah. Yeah. to to keep going, and then we can bring it bring it together. Yeah. Sorry. Great. Uh, good discussion, though. Um, the the question of fair representation is is where we start to get into some of the gnarly issues, um, and so the the table in front of you shows. Um, what the current arrangement as per the 2018 uh, rep review um, shows us uh, with the constituency uh, population ratios. And then the bottom table is applying the new figures, which is the 2023 population data from Stats NZ. Um, and we see that three of the four constituencies are compliant with the plus or minus 10%, but um, Dunstan clearly falling well outside um, the the ten percent now, and not not surprisingly. Um, there are some issues around non-compliance, which is a, are important to note because um, the plus or minus ten percent is not the be all and end all. Um, there there are grounds for going outside the plus or minus ten percent, and the um, local government commission is quite clear, and and the legislation is quite clear that uh, where there are good grounds, you can depart from that 10% uh, formula. So, and that's predominantly around things like uh, providing for island communities and isolated communities. So things like the size of a geographical area is taken, can be taken into account there. Um, and it's also important where um, compliance, if you if you did comply with the plus or minus 10% um, uh, in a strict way, uh, you might end up having to divide a community of interest, so splitting a, a community of interest that, that shouldn't really be split, or you might end up having to group together communities of interest that are actually yeah. quite disparate and don't share a, a community of interest. So um, taking those factors into account, there, there are grounds and the legislation provides um, for those as, as being um, reasons why it may be possible to go outside the plus or minus 10%. So while it's good to aim for the 10%, um, if we if we make a good case, uh, we, there are always there's always the opportunity to go outside that, um, and so we'll we'll head into the have a look at some of the options, the initial options now. But these are really about answering those questions. So how do we address those non-compliance issues, uh, particularly for Dunstan? Um, should we look at retaining the status quo? Uh, in terms of the, the, the constituencies and boundaries, but uh, make an adjustment in the allocation of councillors. Um, should we make some boundary adjustments to the status quo? So keep the same constituencies, but adjust some boundaries. Or should we, or should we create some new constituencies? And we have um, put up as, uh, as a starter, I guess, for this discussion, some options. And as, as we mentioned, those options include both um, 12 councillor um, scenario and a 13 councillor scenario. Thank you, Steve. We've got a question for Kevin. Yeah, just, just uh, the plus or minus 10%. So, so the, the crude way that it is done is simply the your population base, 200,000 divided by 10, which gives you 20,000. Yes. Right? Yeah. And then so your plus or minus 10. So if your population like um, grows, um, grows 50%, and then all of a sudden you've got 300, so you, you'll be plus or minus 30. If you still have ten over three hundred, yes, solid job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 that, and, that, yeah. and, that, and that's what. So, there's no baseline of there's no New Zealand baseline that a councillor should look after ten thousand people or whatever. No, 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 it's, no it's, it's 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 widely varied because yeah. you know. So, that, and that's why you've got um, Canterbury with forty four thousand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's the same form that's working. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 
So let's, with those questions in mind, um, let's head in and have um, a quick look or, or have a look at the, the options which are really here as discussion starters and, um, and to consider what those options might look like. So um, the first option is um, essentially staying with the status quo in terms of the constituency boundaries and the number of councillors, but with an adjustment to the way those councillors are uh, distributed across the constituencies. So no change to, to boundaries, but a change in the allocation of councillors. Um, so Dunstan with four members, Moraki with one, Molyneux two, and Dunedin with five. Um, and that gives us the scenario that you see on that table, which is interesting because it meets the plus or minus 10% test um, while staying within the current um, constituency uh, boundaries. Just to flick on to the 13 councillor option, um, then we can perhaps have some discussion on, on, on this one. Um, same basis of constituency boundaries, but um, adding an additional councillor, uh, which in this scenario is um, takes Dunedin back to six. Um, and we see that uh, Moraki in this case falls outside uh, the plus or minus 10%. So, um, doesn't meet the fair representation test, but is not significantly outside the 10%. Mm -hmm. Shall we move on to um, the, yeah. the, the next one? Or Can I say we've got hard copies of it, the maps of the four options. Would it be helpful to pass them around? Yeah. Yeah. While we're doing that, we'll um, just flip on to... We'll need a buzz. <laughs> Next one. Oh, <laughs> so um option three is the first of our options which looks at making changes to the constituency boundary so um in this scenario uh we create a new whakatipu ward uh, which, which incorporates uh, this is option three this is called the upper lakes split. Upper lakes. Upper lakes split, yeah. Um, and you see that scenario there. So bringing um, uh, Queenstown, Whakatipu, and the Arrowtown, Kawaro wards into a new constituency. And uh, you can see the way the numbers fall uh, under the 12 councillor scenario. Um, so by and large, compliant for four of the constituencies, but Whakatipu falling outside uh, the plus or minus 10%. Change by the two years anyway. Uh, yeah. Option four, which is the same scenario, but with 13 councillors. Um, again, uh, no, no change to the, to the suggested boundaries with the new um, Whakatipu ward, um, but we have uh, Moraki falling outside the plus or minus 10%, and Dunstan Wanaka very slightly outside the, the, the 10%. Um, so doesn't, doesn't quite meet the um, the fair representation test, but it, it is, um, we'll come back to some discussion around how that meets communities of interest um, factors. Uh, and then we have two scenarios, option five and option six, which are around a new Upper Lakes constituency. So creating a new constituency, um, which brings in the uh, Queenstown, 
um, district boundary and Cromwell Ward from central Otago mm. uh, to create a new constituency. Um, Dunstan uh, brings in central Otago, Vincent, Teviot Valley and many a Toto wards. And there's a redistribution of the councillors, obviously, with, with that uh, scenario there. Three uh, for the new Upper Lakes constituency, Dunedin at five, two for Molyneux, one Moraki, and one at Nunston. Thanks, David. I think Kelly's got a question. Well, can, perhaps if we just cover off the next of, of the options and then we'll come, come back and, and, um, and discuss it, because this is the, the same scenario as. Uh, which is with 13 councillors, so just again a reallocation of the um, of, of the distribution of councillors across the, the boundaries and uh, yeah, some of those numbers starting to fall well outside the um, plus or minus 10%, particularly for Dunstan being 21% uh, uh, in the sort of overrepresented um, scenario. Yeah. Um, you will go down there. Yeah. Keep, yeah. Could you just go back to those early ones oh, um, where it had the, the labels for all those headers? Is that difference from the quota? Um, no, that is. Oh, no, that's not. So, so it it would only be if that number was above ten. That, yes, if, if it's a, if it's or below. if it's above or below ten, then it would be not compliant. Gotcha. Thanks. Oh, yeah, there's probably just a comment on that last one with the uh, the Dunson constituency going at minus 21. Um, the whole thing, I would look at that that's one representative and you've got a great big mountain range in the middle of it stopping people getting from, you know, from Roxburgh to Renfrewley. And, and that's just a, you know, it's a physical barrier that would have to be, you know, I just wonder if the realignment is and the practicalities of servicing an area like that um, just yeah. Can I just where, where the Roxbury should be in? Uh, you know, where, where the Roxbury always used to be in uh, West Otago. Uh, I'm just talking rugby boundaries. Uh, used to, and which was the which was the, the council boundaries anyway. I think was West Roxbury was in West Otago, uh, and we had Vincent, and then we had Manny Otago. Um, I just yeah, I'm just thinking long term and physical barrier. Uh, to serve as something as. Can we, I, think, um, I think it's probably best to do the last scenario that's on the slides. Yeah, no, that's good. So we can have a bit of a discussion about what else options there are. Just trying to match these up with these. They've got different titles. Apologies. Well, you've got the one. <laughs> I don't know. It's all right. I just... One with the purple. So that's option 3A, the one with the purple. So each page has, has two options. Yeah, so we've done two slides, so one map. Because the one, two sides, one with 12 councillors, one with 13. <laughs> yeah. one map, it's only, should be able to there's that three actually. key maps <laughs> and two slides for each. And then we've just printed off a copy of the FMU, bound, uh, the, the TA boundaries and the ward boundaries and FMU boundaries, just for information. Okay, and the last one, I think, is with the one with the yellow. It's put up a little bit differently. Yeah, so... We might just be worth going through um, uh, mentioning that we there are a couple of scenarios we did look at but have excluded as being uh, not really viable. Um, that included a new Whakatipu Wanaka constituency. Uh, some of those numbers are starting to fall well outside, plus or minus 10%. And for reference, we've just included some some maps there of the, um, of the other uh, relevant boundaries that have been taken into account. Sorry, that, that one showing the ward district, FMU, and Rohe boundaries. Uh, you've got for reference the Queenstown wards, Central Otago wards, uh, the DCC community board areas, Blutha wards, the Waitaki wards as well. And just again, as a point of reference, the general electorate, electorate boundaries, although they don't um, have a specific relevance in, in this case. So they're just there for, for reference. So, um, yeah, so happy to, I guess, uh, go back to some thoughts and comments and your input on those options. And again, just to reiterate, what we're looking for 
is a steer from you as to which of any of these options would you like staff to develop further, bring, bring back to, to you for further consideration, or are there any other um, potential combinations that you would like some more uh, work done on for us to bring back to future workshop? And Stephen, I think the plan is to get down to one option. Yes. So the, right. the initial proposal must be one option. So this is the opportunity to, to start working through those um, scenarios. But, but uh, um, the main of it. Not at the initial proposal. We could talk that we work through those, but it would have to be a, a workshop situation or, or a prior meeting. Anyone proposal to so, council? So, I mean, uh, if we get, if we, if we got, is there another point for another workshop? We get down, you know, get down to two. We send you home with two options to bring back to us. Is yes, that, is that like an option? Absolutely, we would yes. be able to schedule some time in April, and I understand there's a couple of other workshops needed as well. So we'd look to um, put a day in, and we could bring those. Um, we could bring options back for more discussion. We're absolutely happy to do that. Cool. This was a start. Yeah, um, but obviously we need views and we can bring those back. But we probably don't want, we'd probably prefer to just have two or three rather than seven. Yeah. 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 Okay, so um, basically <laughs> we'll open the floor. Brian's got his hand up. So. Mm -hmm. uh, two, two points. Um, I assume that it's feasible uh, to have a council report at council that has a number of options. I uh, think council then determines the one option that they agree on to go through whatever process, yeah? That would be viable. We might just need time between the first council meeting where we bring you options um, and then drawing up the maps and doing the work to actually bring the final, uh, the initial proposal back yeah, for endorsement yeah. and for adoption. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. So we, we don't necessarily have to sort that out and get no, down no, no, one no, now. We can come up with another one. Yes, 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 yes. My second point is I'm just surprised that you didn't look at splitting up the Molyneux Ward as per those, um, it goes against what I said to Kevin in terms of having a minimum of two councillors, but I'm just making the point. I'm just surprised that that didn't come out as a possible sort of option. Yeah, there's not even, for, for example, if, um, I think as Lloyd said, you know, the Molyneux Ward is, you know, you've got Moscow Urban and then you've got rural and we well or I could be wrong you know like Moskill does Lloyd you know link into all the tiry issues but just making the point I'm just surprised that that wasn't considered as is in one of the options Amanda? Amanda? Yeah so I guess where we've got to today is a reflection of the direction we took from council um, late yep. last year in the December workshop where we were directed around that um that upper lakes is one of the dry, the key the key drivers and then the early engagement. I guess the reality is you could spend weeks and weeks and weeks cutting boundaries and borders. And so that's why we wanted to bring these to you today. And then we're absolutely happy to go away and look at exploring that Molyneux Ward further, but that hadn't come up specifically in, in the, the inputs we've had today. It came out of the survey to the people, that's what they raised. Um, oh, we have a bit of discussion. My gut feeling is, I think, um, if you took if you cut the Molyneux ward at the Dunedin city boundary, yeah. I think you'd struggle to have enough people on the outer outer reaches. Yeah. And is Mosgill not in the same catchment as the Tory? If we look at yeah, the no, no, I accept that point too, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah, that's how I, how I would mm. see it. That um, that hill there sort of creates oh, that catchment there is what we. I'm pretty sure that boundary. hill's a boundary, Kevin. Hey, pretty sure I'll settle all the hills a boundary. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yep. So it's based on catchment, which makes sense. And then Vanessa. Yep. Uh, oh, sorry, Alexa was no, first. councillors come from Moscow. Uh, David, David Shepard used to. Well, not really. He used to wear as many a tato hat. You know, <laughs> <the day. laughs> of course he should. Um, go to Alexa. And then we've got Tom, then we've got Elliot. Um, my gut feeling looking at these, um, I think that... Option three would go down well in my area. I hadn't considered in my own head um, putting Wanaka in with Cromwell and Dunstan 
but they may prefer to be there. Also, like that mountain range that makes it. Yep. Sorry, we also have a mountain range that makes it tricky um, to get across both of those areas. The same issue you have further east, um, but I think Wanaka, just from what I know, speaking from my looking at Wanaka and and trying to service that electorate, I think they might be quite happy with that. With option three, I think um, uh, Queenstown and Aratam Kawara would um, fit well together. That's really good. And, and, and you're crossing um, catchment boundaries because there's two catchments in there, really, because Aratam really is in the Dunstan catchment and uh, Queenstown is in the Upper Lakes catchment. So I don't think that's important enough here. So I don't think we should be stuck with catchment boundaries. But I think it would meet communities of interest. It's close enough in terms of um, fair representation because that minus 16 is going to be minus 10 probably this year. Yep. So that's definitely going to catch up quickly. And um, you may find that Dunstan will be the next big growth area in that. And that 214s and may run into a problem there eventually. Um, Lauren, you. A bit better, I don't know, it's about the same, isn't it, Kevin? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and and that gives the two cons two members for Dunstan, which I think probably most of um, most of the land area there would be happy with that too. That looks like the pragmatic approach to me. Is there? Thanks. Thanks, good, uh, Tom. Um. This is an opportunity for us to align the boundaries with the TAs. And um, it seems that you know that creation of the Upper Lakes option actually fits quite nicely with the Queenstown Lakes District. Um, the Central Otago District fairly well aligns um, with that, that blue area and the Upper Lakes option, which includes Alexandra. Um, the only, the only non-alignment really with the TAs is Dunedin. Um, and I know Dunedin stretches all the way up through Hyde and all that sort of thing as well. But I mean, if, if the opportunity is to, to sort this out, I mean, this is the time to do it. Um, so that's that's just my point. Were you were you talking about this map? I, I was talking at, about the sorry. I was looking at the boundaries um, showing the the TAs, the TA boundaries. On the and, 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 and and looking also at the upper lakes option and just overlaying them basically. Yeah, so upper lakes option is option yeah. five or option six. Yeah, it's a bit confusing. Yeah, it's all it is. Not sure I agree with that. Still. Oh, Thanks. So we got um, earlier. I was wondering if you could take us back through the slides again. I'm, I'm kind of I'm, I'm focused on the the numbers mostly, I guess, and other yeah. Other which numbers are we after earlier? Um more just like the well all the all the numbers really. <laughs> um Good. you want option of option three that Alexa's talking about? Sorry. Is it of option three that you're no all of them. I'm just I'm I I I didn't have time to like memorize all these. It's on your, in, your diligent. It is on diligent. Okay, you might. Easy, yeah. Um, it's diligent then. Yeah, cool. The other were there any options that were under the fair representation? It was just this one. Yeah. So, um, Andrew? So, I thought Alexa is, Alexa is, what Alexa has said, I think. It, Pretty, sum, pretty much sums up where my headspace is at as well. Uh, it's imperative to have Queenstown representation uh, around the table um, guaranteed, in my view. The, the amount of focus up that top end has certainly increased in my time um, on the council. Um, and yeah, uh, there's never going to be a perfect scenario, but I feel that that probably is our biggest hurdle at the moment uh, to ensure there's 
a guaranteed representation at that top end. So I was, have we got that right? That is option three? Or option three with, is, with 12 councillors, option four with 13 councillors. Yeah, so I'm talking about option three, just to be clear. Um, Brian, did you have your hand up? Yeah, no, no, I was still following on from Tim's point about the TA boundaries. How does that fall out? I think you said option five and six. How does that fall out in the numbers? Does that meet your percentage? Uh, yeah, so no, it doesn't. Um, with the Dunstan constituency going down to one councillor, um, that one falls outside, but the others are broadly within. No, Meraki's well outside as well. Mm. Goes to thirteen percent with twelve councillors. Sorry, oh, it's oh, sorry, five percent. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, thirteen sorry. councillors. It goes further okay, out. Okay, so yeah. it's still got an anomaly mm. right between the you know the mm. But oh. saying that of, from the south, like the one, the option three and four has probably got the areas for where growth can take. Mm -hmm. So Queenstown, option three anyway. So Queenstown's got quite a bit of room to to grow. And don't oh, is, is Monica not growing as fast as I anticipate? Oh yeah, it is, but it's it's got a smaller base to start with. Sorry, should I be answering this? So you could, <laughs> it's, it's got a smaller base to start with. So looking at that model, you may find that your next councillor 10 years out is going to be another one for Dunstan to include one. Yeah, that might be a drop of one out of Molyneux or something along those lines. Still got quite a bit of wriggle room. Play with the Molyneux boundary. Yeah. There's more wriggle room in three, I think, or four. Yeah. 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 Three. Three. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Just about it. Oh, so, so I, I actually didn't, yeah, I thought, well, life's quite good and we're going to keep growing. And if you worked on, again, those growth rates that, we, that we've that had, if we said that those were the assumptions, if we take it through, uh, and, but I haven't split, I haven't split the Dunstan Ward, but if we go to four councillors, based on the, uh, that would take Dunstan up to 21,840, Per councillor, which would be minus two. Your, your total would be twenty two three two five per councillor with the twelve with twelve people, um, which would give Dunstan twenty one eight four zero. I know you've still got to split it. I'm not disagreeing with that. So that would be a minus two on that plus or minus ten. Um, Molyneux would be Molyneux would be the only one out, but they have they would have nineteen six nine zero, which is just about being on the ten percent. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Dunedin would be plus five percent at twenty three three eight six, which is it's only yeah it's neither here nor so the fit that and the only the other outlier of course would be uh, the the busless Mariki constituency, which would be plus eight point four percent. So it's still within that boundaries. Sorry, what was which option was that? Uh, that's on option three. That's oh, that's okay. going on off option three. But I just haven't split the if you just use the bulk number of. For Dunstan, I haven't split the wards out, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I just added the population growth on to the Dunstan to each of the wards that we're currently having uh, for the next two, based on over two years. And um, that looks pretty balanced to me. Um, and that would actually give you still room in, in those wards to, in Dunstan to, so that's a, at a minus 2%, which is neither here nor there, but to get up to a plus 10%. And say three years would you'd still be at a decent sort of level. Can, I have a question? Kevin, can we audit your water calculations? Yeah, you can. <laughs> you can. Yeah, 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 you've lost the water. But yeah, I know, but I'm just I'm just saying when when I did it, I, I just I just sort of painted a picture that actually wasn't a bad movement, really. So out of all this, I just got a question. Out of all that, with big Kevin's um, comfortable with three. Yeah, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Just yeah. the question is, can we have a look? And when this is fleshed out further, <laughs> at how long under current growth rates it would take Kakatipu to come inside the ten percent? Oh, would I'm that be something that. that would be considered? Uh, we could um, have a look at that, um, but just note that the the, the local government commission um, points out that you can't use future growth projections as okay. a 
determinant of your current representation review. That's yes, you should answer. absolutely have it in your mind, yeah. and um, I think it's it's important to take into account, but that can't be a formal part of um, the decision making around that. So I think very useful to um, have it in mind in terms of what it might provide for uh, in terms of capacity for future growth, but um, wouldn't be a primary determinant of this review. One more question. I see you've got the Whakatapu, um, so that ward at 35,500. Is that the latest census figures or is that from Infometrics 2023? Because they're very different. Um, all, of, all of these numbers are based on the StatsNZ June 2023 estimates. Oh, okay. yeah, and that's the data set we have to use. Okay, for thanks. Yeah, Thank you. All helpful. Thank you. Uh, and then. Yeah, so when you, when you look at an outlier with that, uh, on that option, with a sixteen a minus sixteen point three, you'd, you'd have you'd be looking at um, you'd be looking at other things like geographical nature, boundaries, and yes, shapes yep. fits in with, yes. um, and then you, I would say that with everything that is in uh, in print and in the media, that I would be difficult for local government not to say well actually that's a growth area and that makes sense but I, I know you can't use it but yeah, yeah that's cool yeah um, Tom. I, look I just think that um, it seems that we're probably all in agreement that the current dumps and ward being split into two um someone that is is worthwhile is is a valid thing to do um, I don't think there's any disagreement about that um, but it is just a sort of the realignment um of, um, I guess, um, councillors across um, the, the new five um, areas that, that is probably is the issue that we need to focus on. Yeah. Uh, Elliot? Yeah, just looking at the options presented, um, I do think three looks the best. Um, two possibilities that I'm, I'm sort of looking at with regards to the map and these numbers to bring um, those differences as close to zero as possible would just that that would also take in the, the communities of interest would be um, Wanaka's populations what would lack seven thousand um, you could move that from Dunstan into Wakatipu uh, considering the public transport connections there um, and that would bring both those differences. Uh, closer to zero, but I understand that that Queenstown um, growth is, is is pretty good justification for that outlier there. Um, and then similarly, was sorry. No, no, sorry. Um, my computer's just frozen on me, so I was running at that. But so, so are we <laughs> suggesting the Wanaka cover this in yellow as well, and that would bring those number that number. And that number, pretty much the same. So leave the upper clue, the part of it in Dunstan, but the Wanaka. Into, into bring Wanaka into Fokkatipu. And, and you yeah. change that to three, Fokkatipu to three, yeah, and you Dunstan to one. those numbers the same, because those those populations would almost be the same if you moved 7,000 from there. Oh, there. I see. Mm. So you're just taking out the town Trebonan. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I... I you know, you'd have to fiddle a bit, but yeah, but to look at how that aligns with the yeah, 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 with the TA because um, that would bring those populations yeah, just... pretty much the same and take away your problem there. And then with the Molyneux and Dunedin, we've got Molyneux, oh. which is, um, in terms of how we do public transport, very much part of Dunedin, um, and for a few other reasons, part of part of Dunedin. If you did bring that into Dunedin, you'd solve those two. Um, obviously they're not over the threshold, but you'd bring both of those two. Uh, much closer to zero as well um, by moving the members. So what have you done then? Well, you, you, you keep, yeah. You're keeping your representation numbers, you're just yeah. shuffling some numbers, you're, you're yeah, just grabbing yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, but it just balances it because those, those over and unders would become a lot closer to zero and you keep those communities of interest secure. That's a, that was a question. Do you think that would still meet the communities of interest? Well, that, yes. Yeah, like I said, like Mosgill make oh, in my head makes a whole lot of sense to be part of Dunedin. Um and Wanaka makes a lot of sense to be part of that Queenstown or that Fakatipu area in terms of 
at the very least in terms of how we do public transport, but also um, in terms of those more urban communities as well, yeah. keeping them together. I don't know. Yeah. Um, just as a reasonably local sort of person. Oh, sorry. I've got to do that so Andrew can hear. Um, in my 50 years of dealing in this area, uh, I've never known my school to be part of Dunedin. Well, it's not really part of anything, but it's more. <laughs> yes, no, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I take, I'll I'll take your point. Yeah, I'm, yeah, just, yeah. I'm just thinking of the. Um, if you go, but we've been talking about that split between Mosgill and the rest of the Molyneux ward as it is. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But I'm not. I, I'm not saying you know it's it's George Street, but. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Kevin, have you have you been on the motorway between Moscow and Dunedin recently? Uh, yeah, it I only did. takes a few minutes. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I've, uh, well, those people in Moscow are going to work in Dunedin every day. Yeah, I, mean, I went well, to the uh, I went to the uh, Moscow and the Torrey drainage and flood uh, both seminars actually, and mm -hmm. spent and spent considerable time out that way. So mm -hmm. I, I'm very familiar with that motorway. What yeah. about the Chatsford uh, seminar? Do you get it? What time? The Chatsford. <laughs> no, I, no, I prefer the Alamon Brooklands. Hang on, uh, <laughs> they're the set of pills. We're, we're um, I'm doing so much date on. So, where are we? Sorry, where are we? Um, I'm not disagreeing with you. Just, just, no, yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right now, so, so right now, I think the feeling of the table is well, what I'm getting is we start 12, um, and the feeling is that we look at, um, Carving up Dunstan um, with a couple of options there, and the own, and it's whether so you might would have a you might have an option based on option three, which is probably the perhaps the go to one at this stage. There may be an option, another option which would be um, this is this only what I'm seeing it, is the Dunstan, the Dunstan, well, the upper Dunstan being based on what we would call the um. Queenstown Lakes FMU area, which is all the water that goes, that takes some water, I think. No, that's divided up slightly differently. Is it? It's upper lakes, which includes upper lakes and Dunstan, because the yeah. narrow town falls into Dunstan. Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. Anyway, doing it's another boundary up here for Wall. <laughs> so basically, it would be leaving from Cromwell and Dunstan initially. And you, if you want to play with the Mosgiel Dunedin boundary, at your peel. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I think you just got to be really careful with that one that you don't. I, I would prefer to have, I'd prefer to have, well, personally, I prefer Molyneux to have two councillors in an area rather than having a one then a six. Yeah. yeah no, you know, and if I had an opportunity, I would, might would try and, like, if you could link Meraki in with, many a total or something like that to get to councillors who knows but i don't think those numbers would work so you know, nothing nothing really works for miraculous it's sort of like a special zone <laughs> <Yeah>. special needs <laughs> thanks I, mean, you... I was just gonna say i think it would be great from a staff perspective to have really clear guidance on how you want us to model the molyneux ward looking differently because the challenge is is it just mosque or is it mosque and middle march is it um you know, the way the, the boundaries work. Uh, I don't think it's simple as just saying put Mosque into Dunedin, so I'd need a really clear steer on what yeah. that looks like. And then just to be really clear as well for the Dunstan revised option, so we'd already modelled uh, an upper lakes ward that was QL, basically the boundary of Queenstown Lakes District Council as it currently is, and that those numbers are right at the end. The, that's the option we excluded because the numbers are quite a way out. What I heard from Elliot was that Within QLDC, I think there's four wards. There's the obviously the Queenstown, Arrowtown, Kawado wards, and then there's the Wanaka mm -hmm. ward and an upper Clotha ward. So you're saying bring the Wanaka ward only into that? Like Tipu. Yeah. There's three three wards and it would be that Wanaka upper Clotha. There's only three. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that turns it into the QLDC. Yeah, so I think that's yeah. the option we've already modelled, and so that model, that's yeah. the one at the end of the presentation, which doesn't work from a numbers perspective. But if you want a clear instruction, I, I think you do need to look at more skills being part of the meeting. Um, well, it's a proposal, that's all it is, but we need to have the information, I think. Um, Tom, can you define more skills? 
So is that going outside of the the DCC community board areas? So I'll just pop them up for you. Yeah. So on the screen of the DCC community board areas, so you're suggesting that we just bring the Mosgiel Teiri kind of community board area into Dunedin, or would it be Saddle Hill, Mosgiel, um, and Strathtyre? I think it'll make it simpler from like a voter's perspective if they know that they're in the Dunedin city area and that's a I would say all of them, but I don't know how that works in numbers. Yeah, we can we haven't so we haven't modeled it, but we can model it. I just be really clear. So that would mean the Molyneux new ward would just be the CODC. Because if you put um Strathtyre, Mosgiel, and Saddle Hill into yeah. the Dunedin yeah. yeah. constituency. Is that then the the, the city boundary the boundary. Yeah. 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 You can see on the current boundaries we well that's a that's a, a proposal. I think you, you perhaps we should look at that. Um, but also, I think the other option would be to keep Strath Tyree as part of Molyneux because of the because of the community of interest type of thing. Um, um, I just around that one. I I think um, you can, uh, I think Strath Tyree and Clutha are completely different communities of interest. They um, they're linked via Mosgiel. Mm. So it doesn't work without Mosgiel to be honest. No, so I was just thinking from its rural areas. That's what... Wow, yeah, but it's what a desert, a desert in a grass field is completely oh. different. <laughs> I don't, I, yeah, it's, it's a case of the issue. Yeah, no, no, she can confirm that with me. Um, yeah. But anyway, it's it's just it's just creating options so that we can make a good decision mm -hmm. on the information. Would that not immediately put Molyneux down to a very, very low number? Yes. Yeah. It would be down to one councillor, probably with nearly enough people. It might still be outside the 10%. Yeah, it'd be well outside yes. the 10%. It would be. Um, and I think from looking back at the past material, the community of interest that was defined around um, those, that, that Mosgiel Strathtyree area being in with Molyneux was around um, flood banks and um, drainage schemes yeah. and that, that, that common. Common interest. Well, it yeah. might just be that the Saddle Hill um, urban Mosgiel Wingatui area is the only is, is what you need to include and and to need. But um, you know, we just need that information. That's all. Make a decision. I think you know, Molyneux is one that's struggling for people. Mm. We don't want to give too many away. Perhaps you could do a scenario where you bring um, Mosgiel over to. George Street. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. Yep. So you want us, you would like a scenario. Yeah. Elliot's point as well. I mean, the ability to juggle the um, the, the numbers. Um, so you you sort of retain a reason to a similar representation. Uh, the, yeah, that actually doesn't quite add up because if you do what you're doing, you, you're giving, you're keeping with the same boat. Anyway, option three actually gives you that already. Yeah. It's it's not, um, this is just creating options for the discussion. You know, if we don't have the information, we're not going to be able to discuss it mm -hmm. um, in, in, in a decision making setting. So, um, where, where do we draw the boundary then? Is, um, I think that's so, depending so, on the numbers. Well, I think you've got to keep it simple. Well, does, I think um, what I've heard is that there's, there's a clear preference for option three yep. as to be investigated, but there is also some questions around whether or not we can bring those quota differences closer by drawing a sensible line somewhere. And yep. I think the risk is that yep. we just overcomplicated in our desperation to get those numbers close, which would actually be counterproductive because it will be hard to understand. So I think I, I think there's some direction there around around seeking some alternatives that bring some of those other numbers closer to the quota. Um, but I'm I'm not sure that 
having that discussion and trying to land on exactly where that line is here without the numbers in front of us and the ability for staff yeah. to go away and have a look at that is, is going to get us an outcome. Um, good to get the direction on three because I think that is, that is good, clear direction. Um, and got have also got the message that when we come back with the paper, which we have more than one option, which was Brian's question um, a while ago, well, we're going to have, we're going to land on one eventually. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple, there's a couple of variances to three that can be um, fleshed out a little bit more to come back, particularly around the, you know, that, that conversation that's just happened with the Dunedin Ward. Mm. But just just to your point, Elliot, I, I understood where you were going with Wanaka and splitting that community board. I, I would, I think, I think retaining the community board as a boundary is important, otherwise it just becomes a little bit too fragmented yeah. up that way, particularly separating off the Wanaka Township from Albert Town or Harwe here and, oh, and yeah. splitting that with yeah. fashion just yeah. wouldn't make sense up, up that way. And just, um, and Lloyd, just if you go to page, um, I can't quite see a page number, but the Central Target District Awards, uh, if we're um, going to do something in that Mosgill Tory boundary, there probably is an option uh, to put the Teviot Ward into Molyneux, which is the which is mm -hmm. the old West Otago boundaries, you know, which is Rockford going yeah. down into. Tapanui. Um, That's if you end up with two many. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just saying there's, yeah, and, and look, it might do nothing because it's, it's only Roxburgh and some pretty dodgy camping grounds in that, in that area, dodgy well, golf right. course. And, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I think I'll, 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 I just want to make you know what I'm, yeah, 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 I'm just sort of saying this. I just want to make a comment as well. I think I can go back to what Kev wrote at the very beginning. Around the uh, area that you're servicing, yeah. not it's not just about people; it's about the area and and you know where our input as a council goes as well. So I think you've just a um, there's a difference between equal and equitable. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be sort of like equal work. <laughs> equitable. Yeah, that's one of the key drivers in the what you've got to put through as well. Isn't that's it? great. Yeah. Um, I think. I think you got a bit there, Amanda. I think you're about to um, get your mapping tools out and your calculators out and come up with a <laughs> cutting plan for us, and we'll probably land back on option three. We've got it's all done so yeah. yeah, and yeah. we'd and we we'll and all and, and I think the other thing probably the homework is just a wee bit of work around the expected points down what the growth scenario may look like. Don't you know we look at. Um, some favorite numbers or whatever our projections, even though we can't use that, even though we can't use it, but it can inform us. Yes, good background material. Yeah, yep, absolutely. So, we've got a slide on next steps up here. So, we'd put in a pro additional workshop if needed. I think we will need that um, workshop. Uh, and then we're aiming to bring a paper to council in May, um, seeking decision on that initial proposal. Um, which we do have a couple of council meetings up our sleeves if we still needed to do further work at that May point. Sure. Um, and then going on to the next step. So thank you very much for all the input. Stephen, did you want to close out with any comments? No, I think it's been a really useful discussion um, and it was uh, good to explore that, that tension between communities of interest and the plus or minus 10% is actually a, a, a key part of this. And I just come back to the, the comment that plus or minus 10% is not the be all and the end all. We do have to look at, you know, that those communities make sense um, and that we can build a case around going outside those numbers uh, to the to the commission when you get to that point. So um, good to hear that reflected in the discussion today. So thank you. Yeah, nice work too, you guys. Mm. Thank you very much. I think you just carried back to like about the second slide where you look at your key principles, community of interest, effective representation yeah. and fair representation of electors. So if you have those, if you have those work on those three principles we can't go too far wrong and I think it's been a good discussion so thank you everybody for having the discussion and putting it out there and and Amanda and her team got a little bit of homework and we'll see you all see you all again um for a, for a, a quick workshop in April. So thank you all very much we'll just close the workshop off. Thank you. Right. Thanks. 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 Thanks.